Well, we were very fortunate that our founders had just a natural instinct for dealing with people. It wasn't something that was having to be written down all the time and saying this is our policy. It was the way of conduct in their life. And so it was handed down to us, a heritage that is more cherishable than that pot of gold that uncle can hand to you. A working environment that is so pleasant, so enjoyable that you are a part of it, that it can't be really defined and qualified for its value. And instrumental in instituting this, I have a great deal of pleasure in introducing the chairman of our board of Tektronics and one of the co-founders, Howard Vaughn. About this. Yeah, that's. Oh, I'm really great, great. I, can, I can hold it. Okay, I'll have to hold it. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, I, I can maybe tell you another uh, story, which is uh, true and, and which may have some merit. Uh, people worry about progressing in the uh, jobs very rapidly. Uh, I was about uh, 28 years before I got a promotion, believe it or not. <laughs> so people who complain about uh, not getting promotions, uh, I, I, I can feel for them. But uh, I thought perhaps it might be interesting and a little bit different if I uh, went back uh, really before the, uh, the start of Tektronix and give you just a little personal history uh, in a sense to illustrate uh, how completely uh, Tektronix spans the uh, time period that uh, oscilloscopes and uh, electronic instrumentation uh, generally uh, has has taken uh, I, I've been interested in uh, oscilloscopes for well since uh, built the first one in uh, 1933 and uh, at that time I was a student in between my uh, sophomore and junior years in college I had to take a year out because uh, there was a pretty deep depression going on at that, that time, and uh, there wasn't any way to, uh, for my family to uh, make it possible for me to go to, to uh, school. So uh, I had done uh, radio service work all that time and was, was actively doing that, uh, and uh, was interested in various forms of uh, electronics other than radio. At that time, radio was just about all there was in the way of electronics. Radio, telephone, there was no television, there were no radar, there was no uh, electronic ovens or anything of that nature. So radio was, was electronics. And uh, uh, that year, both RCA and Dumont Dumont was just a small starting company also in electronics. And RCA, of course, was a major producer of radios. And, uh, brought out uh, sealed cathode ray tubes. The early cathode ray tubes uh, operated on a pump and were not, uh, not sealed. So that you, uh, the reason that they weren't sealed is because uh, cathode didn't last very long and you had to replace them frequently and so you might as well have a tube that you can take apart. But anyway, it wasn't practical for a portable. But they brought out these uh, tubes and uh, I bought one and built, the, uh, built a, uh, an oscilloscope around it. Now, it wouldn't be a very much of an oscilloscope at this time, but it was pretty wonderful then. 
And I believe it was the only one in the Portland area. I'm quite sure it was, as a matter of fact. Uh, and from then on, uh, I was interested in it and built them sort of one at a time, each one a little different and better, usually for somebody that wanted to, uh, wanted, wanted to uh, buy it. And uh, then went uh, on to school and through school and was back in the radio service business. Uh, maybe another point, uh, when I graduated from college, had a degree in physics, first job that I got uh, was building or working with a group building um, forest service radio transmitters. They were a, a transmitter receiver unit that was uh, sort of portable, but it was in a pretty big box and wasn't all that portable. But in any case, uh, the pay was 35 cents an hour, so uh, uh, a little different than, than uh, present. But uh, the tuition at Reed at that time was only $250 also. <laughs> so things changed a little bit. But, uh, but you could still buy a, a package of gum you still had to pay a nickel for. Now you didn't pay a dime. And uh, some things weren't changed quite as much as, as they are now. But in any case, I uh, kept uh, my interest in, uh, in oscilloscopes. And then uh, during, the, during the war, I was lucky enough to uh, be in uh, laboratories the whole time uh, concerned with uh, radar and primarily with uh, radar displays, which are special, just a specialized kind of oscilloscopes, and uh, learned at that time a lot of, of uh, high frequency technology. Uh, I worked uh, in England for about two and a half years in an English uh, radar lab. Well, I was an American Signal Corps officer, but uh, worked on a high-resolution radar set, which is still pretty high resolution. Uh, and it had uh, transmitted a tenth microsecond pulse and had amplifiers uh, with 20 mega cycle, 20 mega cycle at that time, 20 megahertz now bandwidth. Uh, so I learned a lot of uh, high frequency techniques, which now wouldn't seem to be very much, but uh, were pretty significant then. And uh, so when the war was over, came back and uh, with Jack Murdoch, I'd worked, known him before for a long time and worked with him in the radio business. Uh, we got together with a couple other people and, and decided we'd build Oscilloscopes. We'd talked about this even before the war, but uh, that was an interruption that you couldn't put aside. So uh, we got uh, started because I was convinced that the oscilloscope was a much more useful device than it had been given credit for, and that it could be made into a measuring device. Uh, the uh, first oscilloscopes were had no measuring facilities at all. You merely looked at the waveform. And uh, you could indirectly make guesses and calibrations, but there wasn't any facility built into them. And uh, so our 511 that we brought out first incorporated in a pretty crude way uh, measurement, but it had also uh, a 10 megahertz bandwidth, which was pretty pretty unusual for that period. This one over here is one of the first group of 10 that we made. I think it has a serial 101. I'm not sure that it, that's exactly right, but it's one of the first one of the first 10 uh, that uh, that we made. The company was formed in 1946, January, and we delivered those in uh, in uh, 
about May or June of 47. Uh, that time was taken up with a whole lot of things. Uh, had to get a building built, and there were material shortages, and spent as much time on uh, that sort of thing as on, uh, as on the design and production. I did the, all the engineering work on that. Was the, uh, now I wouldn't have the slightest chance to do an engineering on a small part of one of these because uh, it's getting very uh, sophisticated and uh, uh, it in, involves a, a lot of specialists. But we, we progressed uh, from then on. We had uh, very uh, successful uh, operations, both technically and financially, the whole, the whole time. From the time we started, it was 1947, uh, we've always had uh, profitable years. And uh, I think that's a, a pretty good record. The, uh, I think in terms of uh, many of the policies that we have, uh, Jack Murdoch, who's fortunately, unfortunately no longer with us, was uh, very largely responsible. He's a very friendly guy. Uh, he was an excellent salesman. Uh, I saw people come in uh, his uh, radio appliance store with a great big complaint about uh, something or other and end up buying something before they went out. And they were all the best of friends, too. Uh, but uh, and it wasn't because he did anything to trick him or anything like that. He understood. He listened. Uh, he was uh, uh, very uh, willing to learn, see their side, and so on. And, and he's done that. And he put an awful lot of that spirit in. I think uh, it wasn't too hard to do because I believe the people that formed this group at the start and, and the people who joined us uh, were all uh, similar outlooks. So things like uh, there wasn't any reason in the world to not be on a first name basis, and there wasn't any reason to keep that as we as we went on. It's just one little little uh, sort of uh, of thing. But Jack was very conscious of, uh, of people and, and their needs. And, uh, so it's sort of, been, sort of been built in. That doesn't mean that everybody that's ever worked here has been happy uh, uh, by any means. But uh, percentage-wise, it's not so bad if you think of a uh, number of people who have been here a long time. We have, see, we were uh, at a 20-year uh, luncheon a few weeks ago, and I believe it was 550, roughly 550 people who are at, who have uh, got uh, 20 or more Europeans. And uh, considering the number of people that we had 20 years ago, that's a pretty good percentage. And of course, the 10 year people, I don't know the number here, but uh, uh, um, Pretty sure it's over 5,000, uh, substantially over 5,000. So uh, our turnover rates have always been far below those of other industries, or as far as we can find out, of comparable industries in other places. And we're very, very pleased with that. Well, now. Of course, uh, there have been these many changes, and uh, uh, we have more or less successfully managed to go through these various periods. Uh, they, are, they are different. At the start, everybody has to uh, sort of be a jack-of-all-trades. Uh, 
the man who uh, built the uh, building for us who was a friend of my father's. He was a uh, contractor, uh, and he sort of designed this simple building and built, us, built it for us over on 7th and Hawthorne and leased it to us. He said he wasn't at all sure he was ever going to get the rent out of it, but uh, he, he took a chance and won. Made another comment uh, when he was uh, building it. He said that uh, he was going to make the toilets easy to clean because he knew who was going to clean them. <laughs> 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 so <laughs> you see the kind of, <laughs> of jobs that, uh, that, that we did. It's far cry from the specialization that you, that you have uh, now and uh, that you really, you really need now. Well, that's, that's kind of the way it all started. I won't take up too much time. Uh, would, uh, would any of you like to ask any questions about, not necessarily about that, but, well, I'll find somebody who can answer. Uh, the, uh, the tour guide mentioned that uh, the U.S. Bank was the one that loaned the money to get this started. I was just wondering, did you go to a lot of different banks to uh, try when you first tried to get started? Well, I don't know. I think. I think the tour guide is a little bit uh, in error on that. Uh, um, the, the, we, uh, we first, our first uh, uh, banking was with the U.S. We never got any uh, loans of any significance from them to start it. Uh, it was started with uh, just the money that uh, the Four or five of us had saved during the uh, during the wartime years, and uh, uh, we did need some uh, uh, short-term uh, loans at times. But uh, they were uh, uh, we started with uh, the U.S. for a while, and then uh, got a little bit irked at them and. Uh, uh, went to the first, which is uh, also pretty close to us uh, there, and then uh, went back to the U.S., and we have ever since, and we've been very, very pleased. But we weren't really financed by the banks that some companies were. We had uh, enough to uh, get the things out and get started, and uh, selling them wasn't any real problem at that time, and making them was a problem. And so we didn't really have much in the way of financing. I don't, I, I don't think any bank can claim a lot of credit for it. making it go. Yeah. Do you remember roughly how much the first one cost? What's yeah. The yeah. The, the very first ones were $595. And uh, then it was raised to $695. And it, was, and it stayed at that uh, for a long time. Our, at that time, Prices were very stable. You didn't, you didn't have, there, there virtually was no inflation, and uh, uh, we could make uh, enough technical advances and enough uh, savings in one way or another to maintain the, the, uh, the price. The, the second model, of, second model was a, a uh, DC coupled, uh, uh, couple of megahertz uh, job of higher sensitivity than this, into the millivolt sensitivity, and that was 995 when it was sold. But it was a more complex uh, instrument than than this was. I believe all those were sold for 695. Uh, which which uh, was a heck of a of a uh, selling feature because the uh, competing Dumont was uh, 18 something or other, I think, and was two pieces, each of them as big as that, and each of them considerably heavier than that. Power supply weighed about 90 pounds, and uh, <laughs> so uh, took two, two people to transport it uh, conveniently. This was uh, very lightweight. We 
used aluminum and uh, uh, the the uh, power requirements of it were were very moderate compared to the power requirements and some of these others. They used big tubes in the output, lots of power, and uh, they could achieve a, a big picture, a big swing all over the face of the tube. Uh, we didn't think that was important. That uh, that picture is only four centimeters high on there, but uh, uh, that really does just as well as having it all over, all over the tube, and it certainly saves you in, in terms of power and in terms of cost and in terms of uh, performance also, because it's hard to make an amplifier with a big swing that has wide bandwidth. I think we had one more question in the back. Okay, part. yeah. I, I'm sorry, I didn't. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> there weren't any electronic companies this big when we started. Uh, an electronic company, I guess the biggest electronic company at that time was the General Radio Company, which is in, uh, at that time was in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And I believe they had something like 150 people. And uh, they were, that was, uh, to our mind, a big company. And as uh, a matter of fact, I think we'd have been, uh, we'd considered ourselves a success if we had had 50 people uh, uh, in output that, that corresponded to that. See, the electronics wasn't so all pervasive as it is now, and there just wasn't a market. We, we feel pretty proud that uh, the availability of of high performance oscilloscopes help the electronics uh, business a lot. And uh, uh, our customers were the ones that made lots of advances in electronics that generated new markets. And uh, that was great for us because uh, wherever you have electronics, you have oscilloscopes. Now, of course, we have tectronics, many more things than, than oscilloscopes, but uh, uh, they are sort of all outgrowths of, uh, of the uh, oscilloscope technology. Some of them get a little, a little away from that, but uh, that's, that's generally true. Yeah? What kind of growth do you see for tech in the next 20 or 25 years? Oh, boy. <laughs> uh, here she asked, what, what kind of growth do we see? tech in the next 20 or 25 years. Well, my crystal ball in the past has been very poor, so uh, I, I wouldn't <laughs> make any, uh, any, uh, uh, any prediction. But I, th I think it'll be substantial because I think electronics is coming into a, a new phase now uh, wherein it's uh, taking a, an important part in so many consumer things as well, automobiles, uh, uh, appliances, home things uh, generally, plus uh, much more widespread communications, which is a, a big uh, electronics user. Medicine is a really real example where there just wasn't any a few years ago. And you can pretty well correlate real progress in medicine with progress in their use of, of electronics, too, because it really was more of a take an aspirin and call me back thirsty kind of thing. Uh, uh, they really didn't have the analytical devices uh, and means that, that they have now. So if we, if we keep on our toes and keep uh, supplying these markets as they develop and, and in the uh, in another way, develop the things which make possible new new markets. Uh, I don't really see any uh, particular limit to the uh, to the growth. Uh, of course, and we're, and we're lucky in, in being in uh, an industry that you can do that. All industries can't grow because uh, you only have a certain amount of resources and. 
and it has to be shared. But more and more of it is going into electronics. And wherever electronics is, you'll find some tectronics things in a very important place. And that's true everywhere in the world. Uh, I guess not in the, in the Russian area, but uh, they'd like to buy some. <laughs> State, State Department and Department of Defense turn you down every time. So. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you, Howard.